<clears throat> All right, let's do exploit development 102 lecture. Um, today we're going to go over shellcode, but first things you should know is coreland.be is a fantastic website for getting into exploitation development. It's uh, most, it, I think it's entirely Windows based. Um, most books you find out there, like uh, our current textbook and shell, the Shellcoder's Handbook, uh, those are mostly Linux based, Unix based. Um, this is a fantastic resource for getting into Windows based exploitation, and that's where all the money is in both good guys and bad guys. So I cannot recommend this enough. It's, they have wonderful tutorials and exercises. Um, a second note is that later in this lecture, it may happen next time because we may not get to it. It's a long lecture today. Um, we're going to go through a ton of security uh, mechanisms that were introduced to secure executables. Now, they are all introduced for various reasons, and this blog post gives a pretty good history of when they are introduced and why and what the common exploits were at the time and why they were introduced to combat them. So it gives you a pretty good picture of what has happened and why. Um, some corrections from last time. Uh, I did some pretty stupid stuff in a couple places because I don't get a lot of sleep. Um, when I was using GDP to disassemble stuff, I should have switched the syntax to Intel. Um, that may have caused some of you guys to be really confused looking at all this notation for assembly that you're not familiar with. I have slides on how to uh, set the assembly flavor in GDB later on. Also, uh, at some point, I was looking for the return value on the stack, and I was examining the stack relative to the stack pointer. I should have been examining it relative to the base pointer. Can anyone tell me why? <coughs> base pointer changes, too. Right, and when you current frame is constructed, what's the first thing that's put on it? Yes. So, if I was examining the return address, the first thing after it, if I was examining the base pointer, the first thing after it would have been the return address. So, so this is a New York Times article that I mentioned. Um, they also go to. Uh, this is mainly talking about. Um, how they're alleging um, Chinese hackers have targeted them uh, over the past, I think, five months, ever since they released an investiga investigative article uh, showing that, I guess, inciting that uh, China's prime minister has amounted a massive amount of money through corrupt deals and corrupt business practices. Um, and uh, they're tying it their claims to evidence that is common in other attacks that have been used against the U.S. government. The article also goes on to uh, talk about Stuxnet and events that the United States government, Israel, has been alleged of doing as well, as well as Russia when they invaded Georgia. So it goes over a pretty recent history. So that line of today's lecture is mainly going to be on writing shell code. I have about 50 slides on this. It's going to be probably some of the more difficult stuff. I doubt we'll get to... Uh, the later half of this stuff, but we're going to learn how to write shell code. There's tons of tools to write it for you, and you can use Metasploit all day long, but uh, that doesn't really make you that good of a hacker. So you really have to know this stuff. Um, so some good tools for writing shell code are the following: hex edit, NASM, object dump, and the rest. Um, <clears throat> And then there's a there's a project that I've linked down below. It's a GitHub uh, project, and it's basically a shellcode tester. Um, it can test any kind of shellcode, basically uh, locally spawning shell shellcode, no, any form of networking shellcode. It's a pretty solid project. Um, so uh, as we uh, have been using so far, we're going to stick with the Intel syntax, um, also mainly because I hate AT&T syntax. Um, however, when writing shellcode, it's important to note that a lot of GNU tools default to using AT&T syntax. Um, so the following are the commands you use for each of these tools to fix that. Um, so for GDB, 
um, it would be set disassembly hyphen flavor and then Intel. Um, also GCC to compile something to Intel assembly if you're trying to start off writing shell code at a high level by using C and then compiling it, disassembling it, and see what is actually going on from these, the, com the compiler standpoint. Um, so shell code, to define it, is basically a set of instructions that is injected and then exploit executed by an exploited program. It's usually written in assembly. It's originally uh, uh, just used for spawning a shell, but any code at this level is also referred to as shell code. Um, writing shell code is difficult, and there are often subtle nuances in programs uh, that prevent shell code from executing cleanly. And this is why we need to learn how to write our own. Because if you just take a run of the mill exploit and run it, and it doesn't work, um, it could be because of some nuance that you didn't catch. So it helps to be able to know how to write your own so you can make that exploit work. In order to write shell code, we have to really understand system calls. Now, system calls are not the same as system function in libc. Basically, um, <coughs> system calls differ per operating system, um, and I think we've covered them so far, so let's just jump into it. It basically serves as the interface between user and kernel space, and uh, if you try to access kernel space outside of the system call interface, it's gonna, just going to trigger an access exception um, and crash, probably. Uh, so syscalls in Linux are mainly implemented through software interrupts. And the main thing we're going to be seeing when all throughout writing shellcode is this little uh, instruction, int ox80. It um, stands for interrupt. And address 80 stands for basically um, the address of the syscall interface. So when int 0x80 is executed by a user mode program, the CPU switches into kernel mode and executes the syscall function. <clears throat> Linux implements a fast call convention for calling system calls, mainly for higher performance. And this is that uh, you place the system call number into EAX, and then most system calls take a parameter and you place those parameters in the remaining registers. So parameter one goes into EBX, parameter two goes into ECX, parameter three goes into EDX, and so on. <clears throat> Once those have been placed, then the user mode program executes int uh, 0x80, or intox80 is, is commonly uh, shortened to. Um, and the CPU then switches to kernel mode and handles the system call. Um, system calls can use at most six registers. However, you can pass array pointers to an array into each of these registers, and this is pretty common, especially for system calls like exec ve. So the most basic system call is exit, and we're gonna we have this code. It's just main and just calls exit. Nothing fancy. We're gonna compile it with the following. Uh, uh, GCC command um, and statically compile it so we can look at it. And now when we compile it and look at it with GDB, uh, we're using Intel assembly notation, we can see it's pretty simple. Um, for handling the system calls, the Intox80 here, we can see that it's moving things into EAX before each one. Now these are the numbers to uh, <clears throat> correspond to the system call in the system call table. And this one is passing a parameter into EBX. Anyone have any questions on that? I'm gonna, next slide is basically um, the very top of the system call table that is usually located in user include and then whatever architecture we're working with, and unistd.h. Um, there are a couple hundred or so system calls. Um, exit is number one, 
and exec VE is number 11. So is what? I, I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. Just C library, they still have a function named Yes. So many many of these system calls have uh, similarly named functions in the standard C library. And all these do is basically, when you call these, these C library functions, it passes the parameters to them on the stack. All the, the, the C library function does is basically take them from the stack, handle them, put them in the registers, and then call the intox AD. So in order to call exit, we need to do three things. <clears throat> we need to, in EAX, put one, because that's the index for the exit system call. And exit takes a parameter, an integer. It, but the, the parameter of zero when passed to exit means it exits without error. Any non-zero number passed to exit specifies an error code. So the following assembly down below is simply all that is necessary to basically execute the exit system call. Um, so basically we move zero in EBX, we move one into EAX, and then we do intox AD, and that's it. So to assemble it, um, we use NASM, uh, the network assembler, um, and we pass it the header uh, F ELF to specify um, we want it to output a, a elf object um, and then we link it here and this lets us get our opcodes with object dump um, we have to pass object dump an object file and if you don't use NASM to create a elf object um, it will just create raw instructions and object dump won't be able to, to parse the opcodes so <clears throat> Here we can see move EBX zero, move EAX one, and then intox 80. And this is the shell code actually. And when we convert it into a character string, we simply prepend the slash X and then BB slash X zero zero and so on and so on. It's pretty simple and straightforward. However, it will work in certain cases especially in this case where we render it as an integer to cause those characters to escape and thus be rendered in an executable format for the processor. However, if we were to enter this into a buffer overflow or into basically an environment variable, there's a problem because this is in character format and we have null bytes here. So in this version, since we're rendering it basically in an integer and escaping it, we can verify that it actually works. Um, I could modify it and put some other system call down here, um, like a, a mem copy or something, to show you that this exit is not actually the normal exit that's being called by the 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 process that calls main. Um, so strace is a pretty useful tool for verifying that we're calling our system calls right. Um, strace calls for, stands for system uh, call trace. Um, so every one of these entries on the left is actually um, a system call that was listed in that system call table that I brought up previously. So this thing will run exit, but causing a program just to exit is not very interesting in itself. And it's just served as a, an, a lesson to show you it's not that difficult. Basically training wheels are actually doing shellcode. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> the shellcode will not actually work in most injectable attacks because there are null characters and null characters terminate strings. So if we were to inject this and try to point something to it, the only thing that would get run 
would be slash b slash xbb and then would terminate here. So this is one of the common hurdles to writing useful shell code. No bytes will cause shell code to fail that is in, meant to be injected. And we need to creatively find ways to change our nulls into non-null byte opcodes. And there are two common ways to do this. Basically, find the assembly instructions that are causing these null opcodes, and then try and replace them with instructions that don't uh, result in op, uh, null opcodes. Um, so <clears throat> there are common tricks like using ZOR and then um, AL and AH registers, and I'll get to that in a second. I have a slide and a couple slides on what those registers are, because you probably aren't familiar with them. Um, and this can be kind of tricky. The second method is much more tricky. Basically, we want to craft shellcode so that nulls are added in at runtime with instructions that do not create nulls themselves. So basically, our shellcode has to modify itself while it's running. Um, this can be really tricky because you need to know the exact location of your shellcode in memory or perhaps play around with tricks so that you can relatively address things so that it's position independent. And we'll get to this. Um, but we're largely going to work with self-modifying code next time. But I have a couple, I have an example this time. So <clears throat> let's revisit this so we can get basically exit shell code to work without uh, having any nulls in it. So <clears throat> both of these instructions cause these null opcodes. <sighs> Move zero and EBX is the same as zoring out EBX with EBX and actually will result in a, uh, a kosher uh, opcode. Similarly, move EAX, move one into EAX is equivalent to move one into AL. Now, EAX is a 32-bit register, and when we try to move one into it, it gets expanded because we're moving hard-coded value to a 32-bit value. So this 0x1000000 000 000 is a little Indian notation for 0000001. So if we were moving it instead into an 8-bit register, it wouldn't be expanded in that way. So this is how registers actually are broken down. This is all left over from the 1970s with the days of the 8080 processor and it's for backwards compatibility. And remember, backwards compatibility is the bane of security and makes many of these shell code tricks possible. So the AH and the AL bits were introduced when the AX register took over as the 16-bit basically processors came about. And then EAX came about uh, when 32-bit processors were introduced. The previous register types were kept simply for backwards compatibility to ensure that old code worked. So there's actually no register to address the, the upper 16 bits of GAX. And uh, the, the AL refers to the first 0 through 7 bits um, of the EAX. And AX can be used to refer to the first 0 through 15 bits of EAX as well. So when we rewrite it like this to move AL1, this will not get expanded. And when we compile it again, we'll see that the object dump shows that the opcodes have no nulls in them. Also, this shell code is smaller because these things aren't expanded. And that's always a good thing. Will the upper bits of the EAX register zero out? Were you guaranteed they're zeroed out? Not necessarily. It depends on where it's at and what's happened before it. So that's an important thing to know, that the upper bits may not be zeroed out. So this shell code will actually work um, as the previous shell code did. Um, and this leads us to basically five steps for writing shellcode. 
use some high-level language to write the desired code, and then compile it down, disassemble it, and use that to basically analyze how the program works at the assembly level. Figure out what's going on. You may have to write your own and use the, the, de the disassembled version as a reference, or you can use the disassembled version uh, and clean it up, compact it, and then make it injectable. Um, and then, once you've done that, extract basically all the opcodes and create the shell code. So, <coughs> let's work with something that actually is going to spawn a shell. And we're going to use the exec VE function provided by the standard C library. I think I have the man page. So this is the man page for exec VE. It takes in three parameters. The first parameter is a pointer to a file name. Second parameter is a pointer to an array. And the third parameter is a pointer to another array. The first parameter is basically the file name that exec VE is going to try and execute. It's supposed to be a program that has executable permissions. The second one is basically going to be the arguments that are going to be passed to that file. <clears throat> and the third one is basically a pointer to a, an array of environmental variables. This is largely irrelevant to us at this low level. Um, and we can spawn any kind of shell code without having to worry about this. So we can just pass it a pointer to a null. So what's going on with this C code is that we basically declare f name to be uh, slash bin sh. Um, the slash x00 I could have actually omitted. Um, I think I did in a later slide, and I forgot to leave it here. And then we def declare our array, and we set basically the first argument um, of the argument array to be the file name, and then we terminate the array with a null. And then similarly, we just set the environmental variable array to null. And then we will execute it, and if you compile this, it will spawn a shell. I think I actually have. All right. Do I have this? Not this particular one, so we'll move on. All right. No worries. So, moving forward, when we when we're going forward, we need to basically think about writing shell code that is going to be position independent. When we're passing it or pointers to stuff, is the pointer going to be some hard coded value in memory, or is it going to be relative to the stack pointer, or perhaps the base pointer? And is it also going to be injectable, so thus it has to have no nulls in it? Um, so these are the things that we're all going to have to deal with. So, the thing about making arguments passed as hard-coded addresses is it makes the shellcode fragile. If something changes, an address changes, it can break your hard-coded addressing scheme. Um, and that's actually very likely to occur. Um, considering that um, users' environmental variables are all pushed on the stack, and that can change how things are addressed on the stack if you're uh, using some hard code address of something on the stack. Um, and those will change per user, because that has all their preferences and stuff like that set in there. Um, and then there's also uh, <clears throat> the amount of DLLs and stuff like that and shared objects that can be loaded into a process can vary. Basically, any single, any single thing that is an input to the program can uh, change, basically, the, can offset the whatever you thought the address was going to be for something and cause any hard-coded addressing scheme to fail, which is why the main strategy for writing shell code for passing parameters and pointers to parameters, rather, is to use some sort of relative addressing scheme. This creates 
shellcode that is position independent means that no matter where you put it in the process memory, it's going to work. And so when you call exec VE um, in the standard C library, all these parameters must be pointers. And what it does is it takes these pointers and moves them into the registers and then calls the intox 80 system call. So for exec VE, EAX is going to have the integer number to address the exec VE system call, which is 11. EBX is going to hold the address for some string that's in memory um, for bin sh. Um, and that's going to have to be null terminated. So that means there's going to be a null terminator in our opcode, depending on how we write it. So that's an important thing to be aware of, as with any string. Um, <clears throat> ECX will hold the null terminated array for arguments to be passed to exec VE. And like I said, we only need one argument, and that's the program name. EDX will hold the null terminated environmental variable array. And as we said, that's not necessary, so we're just going to set it to null. So we're going to take this exact shell C code, this code, and we're going to compile it and use object dump to see what's going on. However, when we do this, the output is going to be huge because we've included uh, the UNI STD library. So when we compile it statically, every single one of those functions is going to be in there. And so that's going to make the, uh, the object dump output be massive. So what I've done um, is I've just cut out the main and the exec VE uh, instructions to save time. So this is them. Um, on the bottom right, I have some stuff that's kind of grayed out. Maybe should have made it darker, but it's not relevant stuff. Um, basically, this is main on the left. And here we have the call to exec VE. And then exec VE here is here on the right. And the line that's highlighted is the intox 80 instruction. And this can be really intimidating to look at. Um, because there's a lot going on and it's really hard to understand. But we can use this basically as a basis to figure out what we need to do. <clears throat> and as you can see on the right, the exec VE system call isn't actually that complicated when we get rid of all the stuff that's grayed out. Because all that's really going on is that Something's being moved into ECX, something's being moved into EDX, something's being moved into EBX, and something's being moved into EAX. And that's it. So, revisiting this. <clears throat> this doesn't have anything new. Let's try and write some shell code that does this. So, this is a trick. Um, to put the string bin sh at the end. Because it's going, it's going to be null terminated, if we put it at the end, it's not going to be a problem for us. If we put it anywhere else, the string is going to terminate before the shell code is finished. Or rather, the string is going to cause the shell code to terminate before it's finished. So, the very first instruction is a jump. It jumps all the way to the bottom to some label I have as part two. The first thing part two does is it jumps back up. Now, the reason I did this is that by doing these calls, it places this address on the stack as a return address. So we can basically use EBP um, to basically reference the string. Now, the first thing we do is instead of just calling EBP all the time, 
is we pop that off the stack because that's the very first thing on there is this address. So we pop that into EBX so we can work with it. What we're going to do is we're going to zor out EAX to get a term to get a uh, basically a null byte so we can use to terminate things. Now the shell code I have down here is slash bin sh, and then I have a capital X, and then I have lead, and then I have boss. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take capital X, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we're going to replace the X with a 8 bits of 0. Now, when I do Zor EAX EAX, that's 32 bits. But if I address it with AL, it's only going to use 8 of those. And that's exactly what we want to do. So characters only take up 8 bits. And so by doing this, we replace this with basically slash X 0, 0. And that's the null byte. So we'll terminate there. Um, now, we can still use this as basically uh, other stuff. So <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to put the adder from EBX where leet is. And that's going to be basically the first parameter to the argument variable. So the first parameter to the argument variable is going to be pointer that points here. It's not that complicated. So what we do after that, once leet has been replaced, does anyone have any questions right there? I don't want to go too fast. Yeah. So we're going to be calling the execute function on the bin sh and then the address is where these things come to. So bin sh here I actually use the mouse, so it gets recorded. This is going to be the first parameter to uh, exec VE, and we're going to terminate it so that string ends uh, here before the X. We're going to replace the X, and then we're going to have this be the start of the, uh, the args array. So remember, exec VE takes three, three parameters. First one's a file name, pointer. Second one's a array pointer, and that array pointer is just going to have bin sh in it as the first argument, and then it's going to be null terminated. And then the third one is going to be a pointer that we're going to set to null. So we could create a new address and set it to null, or we could reuse an old address as something that's already null. So what we're going to do here is since we set leet to point to the address for bin sh and it gets terminated here by this new null that we put there. We're going to move on and terminate that ar array because it, we're going to use this as our array for the args. We're going to make this null. So EAX, we did zor EAX EAX which zeroes it all out so we're going to terminate it and make it a null pointer. Now What we're going to do is we have to set yeah so we have EBX set we don't have to worry about setting that that's already pointing to the address of our string we have to set EAX ECX and EDX ECX is going to take that arguments array and EDX is going to take that environment point variable array so now that we've set up the argument array we're going to basically load the address of that into ECX. So ECX is going to point here to where Leap Boss was edited. Whoops. Going back. Now, we could create a new place of memory for another null byte to use for EDX, but we already have one. And we want to be compact with our shellcode. Um, so we'll just reuse this EBX plus 12, and that points to where boss is. So we're just going to point EDX to there, the second half of basically this array. Now, exec VE, when we call it, doesn't really care if we're overlapping our pointers and stuff like that. So 
lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to do move the system call number in DEAX and then launch the exploit. Does anyone have a question? Uh, I think because in this instance, move created some null bytes, and this example has a few null bytes in it. I didn't want to have that many because I didn't want to bog you guys down with those details. So, yes, you could have done move ECX, uh, comma, EBX plus eight, um, and that may work without null bytes, but that's just the way I chose to write it. But the other way is totally equivalent. Oh. Yes. Is there a line in which you have some of the, some of the CPUs require memory to start at the, at the four, eight, and so on? Uh, Could there be a memory issue? An, an addressing issue, do you mean? Um, there shouldn't be any addressing issues here because everything we're doing um, is relatively addressed. So we, the first thing we did is we called down the bottom and we got that address. Um, and then we used that to get on the stack and we popped it off into EBX and we started relatively addressing everything there. Um, so regardless of where this is going to be put or how things are laid out in memory, this should work if we jump to it. Does anyone else have any questions? So to follow up on that. <laughs> The addresses and pointers I'm moving into those registers do not have to be on on a line in memory. Anywhere. Right. It can be anywhere. Right. That's a great question. So um, usually when you're looking at things in GDB, uh, like the addresses will be there'll be one address and then the next address is four different. The next address is, is eight different, four more from the last. Now you can address things in between that, so exactly like that. Good question. Any other questions? This is difficult stuff. Is anyone lost? Feel free to raise your hand. I'd be happy to help you out. Okay. So when we, we compile this to look at it, uh, I'm just using hex dump to look at it. Um, we can see right off the bat that there's some zero zeros in here. And so we have to go in and correct this. So <clears throat> I want to give you guys some uh, notes on using NASM. In this example, I just did <coughs> NASM and then the assembly code. I did not use the option hyphen F space ELF. What this does is it creates basically a raw instruction set. And if you try to run the file program on it, it will tell you it's a DOS executable or a COM file. So this is super useful for getting the finished product of shellcode um, because if you could just compile it with straight NASM, it's not going to put in any objects or shared objects. As long as your shellcode doesn't require any of those things, then it's all gravy. However, you cannot debug this with object dump now. Um, hmm, that screenshot got kind of mangled. So basically, if you try to run object dump on this now, because it's a com file, it's going to tell you file format not recognized. Because object dump takes in basically ELF objects uh, as its input only. So, in order to do this, um, you can look at the NASM page and look down at the options, and there's the dash F format, and it tells you exactly what it does. It's basically, if you give it hyphen F space ELF, it's going to produce a Linux A dot out and ELF object files, respectively. <clears throat> so, in order to use object dump, we're going to have to do NASM, give it, tell it to output an ELF object file, and then once we do that, we have to link it um, to link in uh, basically standard C library. And then once we do that, we'll be able to dis disassemble it 
and this is what it looks like. So now that we've recompiled it so we can look at it with object dump, we can see exactly what assembly instructions are causing those null bytes. And this is really useful. Um, if you were to just try to do this with hex edit and be like, hey, why is there a null byte there? You wouldn't know what instruction in assembly is corresponding to that null byte. <coughs> so this is an important step. So we know that move slash xb and the eax is causing this. <coughs> And uh, I've kind of told you guys why before. Does anyone have a guess as to why this instruction is causing null byte? Yes, 32 bit register. Yeah, okay. Good, good. So it gets expanded. So easy way to fix that is to use AL and put 11 in there. And it helps that we... Uh, did Zor EAX EAX beforehand. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to guarantee that the, the upper bits of it would be zero. And so this shell code, yes. Yes, the jump short part two. Okay, you mean you arrange the part two just for... Uh, I, I simply arrange part two to be at the end because it's going to be ended with that string. Um, and end of the string? Yep, and that, and so I put it at the very end of the shell code and it makes it nice so I can refer, also not worry about uh, that null byte being a problem um, and also so I can use this little trick to relatively address it. Okay, you just arrange the, the orange load short on the left. Yep. Any questions on that? Yeah. So if you had an XOR EAX for itself, what would you do? Would you, put, would you put that in there as well and move AL? Uh, would you, do that? I, you could probably move Zor EAX EAX right before move AL11. So you could then insert another instruction yeah. instead of just changing one? Yeah. Actually, you could have move EAX EAX in there again right before move AL11 as long as it didn't create a you know a null op code you can do things like that so yep yeah so it's important to if you're using just specific bits of something here and there to avoid writing op codes and then you're passing a larger version of that register be it a 16 bit or 32 bit version of that register to something else it's always important to note if it's always important to make sure that the upper bits that you haven't touched are also zeroed out because there's no there's no telling what they could be. So the great thing about this is that now it has no null bytes and I am going to So we have the shell code, and we have the jump trick, and then part one, part two. I'm going to put it in an environment variable. Um, And then there is a nice little C program provided by the book that um, I may have covered this last time. It has two parameters. It takes an environment variable and a target program. 
and it tells you where that environment variable is going to be on the stack. So I don't have to use any NOP sled or hunt around for this. Um, so this is nice. And so I'm going to And then, let's see, uh, what have I done last time? This is a, sup a simple uh, program. It just has an unsafe string copy. So we can use this to uh, point to our shell code with a buffer overflow. And I'm going to just basically do this little demo to show you guys that this shell code does work. Um, <clears throat> so. So I'm gonna run this. Oh, let me turn off the light so you guys can see. Is that all right? Anyone with the lights in the back on? Good, good. All right. Can you guys see that? I'm gonna bump it up. All right, that's better. So we use this program to find out where this environment variable is going to be on the stack for this program. And so exploiting it is as simple as doing this now. Now we have to put it in little Indian format, EA, F9, FF, BF, and then let's repeat it like 40 times or so. And we get a new shell. So now let's do uh, another example to show you that it's really, it is truly position independent. It doesn't matter where I put a new shell code. Um, uh, Let's see, I've toyed around with note search. Um, I just need to check one thing. I need to give this so this program, what it does is there's a file in slash var directory called notes. And it's owned by root. And so this is a set UID program that basically allows for users to send messages to each other and get stored in this root directory. So only root can basically modify it. Um, so by having this program, note search, be owned by root, and by setting the UID bit, we can let other users write notes here and there. Now, <clears throat> there's a buffer overflow vulnerability in note search. Um, basically, it's, uh, I think, just an unsafe string copy. There's a bit of code to this. Um, but there's just one vulnerability here. That's usually all it takes. Yeah, it was a top. I was just looking for more. So, right there. Yep. So, all we need is one vulnerability. And what we're going to do is we're going to see where on the stack our shellcode is going to be put for node search. And then, so all we need to do is 
is printed out now. Slash x, de, slash x, f9, slash x, fs, slash x, bf. And let's do it like 100 times. And boom, we get a shell. And this time, it's a root shell. So um, just that's a good demo of how it worked in different addresses because it's not uh, hard-coded with the addressing because we use that little call trick. It's a pretty good trick. <clears throat> All right. So, any questions so far? Yeah. What happens when you exit that shell? Where does it go? That's a good question. Now, in previous class, we showed return to libc, and that uses system function. Um, I also showed you basically pushing the address of system, and then for that return address, pushing the address of exit, then pushing the parameter to system the string, pointer to a string, bin sh. The reason I push the exit address in that instance is because I'm not calling straight system call exec ve. Exec ve exits the process when it's called. So when I exit the shell, it just exits cleanly. There won't be any corruption. There won't be any corruption. There won't be any seg fault. It won't try to return to the exploited process. Good question. Thanks for asking that. Questions? Okay. Is anyone lost? Okay. Yes. Yes, exact VE overrides the local process image. That's precisely correct. Is it somewhere with EXEC? Like I think so, yes. I think so, yeah. So, so far, um, I hope your minds aren't about to explode. Uh, showed you uh, the importance of the slash F flag for NASM and how that's uh, used both ways. Um, showed you guys how to do string calls and how to put things in the registers. Um, showed you a nice trick with putting your string to manipulate the end of your shellcode using a call trick convention to access it for remote addressing, uh, relative addressing rather. Um, and then showed you just a small set of creative ways you can use to remove null characters. Uh, the book has more. Um, the shellcoder's handbook has many more. Um, the only thing I dislike about the shellcoder's handbook is all the assembly notation is in at and syntax. Yes, question. Um, I was just reminded, I had, a, I had a question about the call trick. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go back to it. <coughs> just to clarify, if you were to happen to run into part one, the null bytes, how to determine it, would it jump back and return to part two or would it just exit out of the whole thing? So here's the, here's the problem. When I'm putting this into process memory, say when I'm exporting it, um, and there's a null byte in part one, the shellcode is going to get truncated right there. Part two and everything after that, no one little null byte is not going to get put into memory. So it's not really, I may have misspoke earlier, it's not a problem that it starts executing and it gets to this null octo and it's just like, okay, I'm done. What is actually the case is that when it's getting string copied, when it's getting whatever string function put into an array, arrays are almost always null terminated. So that function of putting the, injecting the shellcode into memory is going to cause a truncation of the shellcode at any early null bytes. Is that clear? Okay. Good question. So, um, we're not done yet. <coughs> Privileges. Uh, this is an important little thing that pops up in a lot of caption flag games. Um, it is common for things that are running at set UID to drop their permissions before they do normal things. They really only need uh, 
permissions to do whatever they're set UID to, usually it's root, for a very small subset of things that are actually designed to. Um, like password only needs to set UID bit to open up the password file. Then once it has it in memory, it can drop permissions, edit it, then needs to raise its permissions again to write it, and then it can lower it again, just as an example. But for you know modifying things in memory and stuff like that, doing normals, moving around and parsing and stuff like that, you don't always need uh, root or set UID access to be the highest. So you can drop your privileges down to a different user account level. So this C code below is a really simple uh, program. Basically, it takes in a function, uh, it takes in a string, and it's basically a, this code is cut out of like a little game. So this game has a string and it's basically players try to guess a string or something like that. And I just copied out this stuff. Um, and so what it does is right when it takes in the string, it lowers its permissions for whatever reason, because it doesn't need those permissions to do the rest of the game. And then it has this unsafe string function. Now, if I were to just use the shell code that I just previously used and overflow this buffer and overflow the return address and point the EIP to that shell code I crafted, it's going to spawn a shell code at this set UID of level of five, whatever that user corresponds to. However, nothing prevents an attacker from crafting shellcode that calls these set UID system calls. Now, the really, actually, I should correct that. Nothing prevents an attacker from calling the system call to reset the SUID. Because you can't just craft a, uh, you can't just, at the beginning of your shellcode, set, set, set UID to 000. zero, zero. Give me root shell always. That will actually be disallowed. Um, you will not have permissions to do that. <clears throat> so here's an example. Um, the calling convention for uh, set, basically reset SUID. Um, actually, I've been saying that wrong. Um, set RESUID stands for set. Uh, RUID and then set EUID. So let's uh, hold the man pages for that actually so you guys can see. All right. So this is the system call for setting the real and the effective uh, UID for this and the saved user or group ID. Um, whether you're using set RE SUID or set RE SGID. So, well, you guys can read that on your own time. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left. I have more to get to. So, what I'm trying to get to get at is that. Um, <clears throat> Nothing prevents an attacker from uh, using this themselves, zeroing it out, and restoring uh, uh, the privileges. And so this is example shellcode that does this from the book. Um, this shellcode dynamically builds uh, slash bin sh on the stack, as opposed to using this call convention. Um, so that is something you guys can look at, um, but I have more to get to. We'll, we'll come back to this definitely throughout the class. There, we'll have an example later on, um, probably in class, an exercise, um, combining this and other topics later on. So these are some reference slides. Um, for 64-bit architecture, all the E's get replaced with R's. It's really that it's simple. And then they doubled all the registers. So after the eighth register, which is RDI, um, because they go zero through seven, there's R8, R9, R10, R11, R12, R13, R14, R15, etc. <clears throat> so it's 
pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of conventions and system calls and stuff like that that get changed. Um, now, when dealing with Windows, uh, we're going to cover this mostly next time. Um, as we discussed previously, uh, you can't just call the Windows NT DLL system calls. You have to use the Win32 API. So basically, you have to load the address of the Win32 API DLLs. And these addresses will vary for each version of Windows, so Windows XP, Service Pack 1 versus Service Pack 2 versus 3, and then Vista 7, 8, etc. And these DLL addresses can be found at runtime or they can be hard coded. The kernel 32 DLL part of the Win32 API has functions to find these things at runtime, specifically load library and get proc address. Um, and I hope to have an example of this next time. So, this is how the stack looks like in Linux. Um, this is uh, an alternative view of some previous diagrams we showed you. Um, at the very top and the highest memory is kernel space and the user mode uh, code cannot read or write from these addresses. And trying to do this will result in segmentation fault because of an access exception. Um, and then the stack starts relatively at the top of higher memory and grows down towards lower. And then in between the stack and the heap is actually the memory mapping segment. Um, and that's for dynamically linked libraries. So all the shared objects, those actually get loaded in at that space in between the stack and the heap. Um, and then the heap starts uh, towards lower addresses and it's actually uh, the BSS segment is somewhat part of the heap because the BSS segment has uninitialized static variables that uh, are they're declared but uninitialized, so they're just there and the programmer doesn't know what's going to be put in them. Um, and then there's a random offset between it and the heap, and the heap grows up roughly. It doesn't it doesn't operate in the iteratively way that the stack does. So one thing gets pushed right after another. The heap has an allocator algorithm um, that we're going to discuss. Um, the allocator algorithm, um, there's two main ways of doing it, and we'll cover them. But the main thing that both those ways have in common is that they've been roughly randomized so that you can't predict what's getting put on the heap where. Um, And so this is actually what Windows looks like. It's quite different. The top of this diagram is low memory, and high memory is at the bottom. Um, I took this from coreland.be. Um, this is kind of funny. I've been, I've been working with people who do Windows exploitation. And I asked them previously, um, when I was putting together the stuff for this class, um, so is the stack and heap oriented the same way in Windows as it is in Linux? And they're like, yeah, totally. I mean, that, that's always the case. And I did all my research. I'm like, uh, I think you're wrong. And so what actually ends up being the case is that um, here in higher memory, uh, you basically have uh, this is uh, the PEB block, um, and then here it says no access. That's basically maintained by the kernel for Windows. Um, shared user page is, uh, I think, a page that's shared among threads. DLLs get put in here. Now, in Windows, you can have multiple heaps. Um, so this memory space here is actually for uh, uh, multiple heaps that can be created by other threads in the process. Now when DLLs get loaded in Windows, those DLLs can create their own threads and those can create their own heaps. I know it's a little confusing, um, but we're not worried about that just yet. So the main thing that you guys need to know is that um, after that is the program image. So you have the .text segment and all the other segments here. Then the heap starts right where the stack starts. They start off touching each other basically and they grow apart. 
And so, yeah, that's, that's from Corland.be. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, means the stairs on window is limited? Is limited? Yeah, so you cannot go. Yeah. Uh, it's near a mirror, you cannot go any further. Right. I mean, you, you can't. Yeah, there, there is a limit. Yeah. <coughs> So, hopefully you guys have all seen this little error message that basically this process has encountered a problem and it needs to close. We're really sorry for the inconvenience. You can send us an error report that we'll totally disregard because we don't look at those things. Or you could not send us one. Okay, thanks, bye. Uh, so, uh, SEH exploitation is a kind of a little advanced topic, but since we've done a decent amount of buffer overflow and stack attack so far, it's not going to be that difficult to dive in. Although it's a Windows, uh, is jumping from what we've done all so far as Linux straight into Windows. So structured exception handling, SEH, is basically how Windows handles try catch. This window something has encountered a problem needs to close is the default exception handler provided by Windows. If all the other exception handlers have been tried and it gets to the final default one, it spawns this message to say it now needs to close. So exceptions are special events that interrupt normal process behavior. Each exception handler, when it's compiled, is mapped onto the stack in basically eight bytes. Now, that's called a structured exception handler record. And there can be multiple ex exception handlers. There can be try catch, try catch, try catch, try catch. Now, <coughs> these eight byte records actually have two pointers. Each pointer is four bytes. And it basically forms a linked list. One pointer points to the next exception handler, and the second pointer points off to the code to handle the exception. So there are two types of exceptions. Um, there's SEH exceptions that are, are, these are the only ones available to C programs, and so the compiler supports them with uh, try, accept, and finally, and stuff like that. And then there's C++ exception handlers, which are implemented on top of SEH. And everything in C++ is basically <coughs> supports abstraction, building things on top of existing functionality, the whole notion of inheritance and object-oriented programming. So the M Microsoft Visual C++ compiler implements this in a very complex way. Um, but what it does is it allows for throwing and catching of arbitrary types of events. Um, however, the cost is that in order to do this, this, the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler implements basically automatic stack unwinding during exception processing. And in order to support that, there are lots of checks and flags to ensure that it works properly in all cases and also to secure it. So just like think of that, I mean, that's what's going on with the C++ version. Um, there's a lot of extra stuff going on. But it still kind of works. It just means that there's also potentially more places for it to go wrong. Because now if I wanted to make that guy fall off his bike, I now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight wheels that I can throw a stick through to get caught in the spokes and make him fly off the bike. So you've all seen structured exception handlers. So this is a simplified abstract view of the stack. A couple more minutes left, so I'll get to the end of this and have to stop it. So you have basically the top of the stack, you have your local variables, saved EBP, and then basically what, what's important on the right is the, the diagram tries to show you what is relevant to the try block. So these variables on the stack are all relevant to the try block. 
and the very bottom is the address of the exception handler, and that points off to the actual code that's executed to handle the catch um, to evaluate the exception. So a, no, a normal stack without SEH, Linux does not support SEH. So for instance, a Linux stack, basically the top you have your local variables, you have some stack data, you have the save EVP, and at the bottom of the stack frame you have the return address, and before below that you have your function arguments being passed into this function. Now when your stack is on SEH, uh, Basically, it gets more complicated. You have double the stuff going on, and it's kind of a mess. But really, uh, so I've highlighted in red the local function variables. Um, so you have the ESP. What really changes is the stuff that's in bold um, from, well, I didn't bold at all. But you have the exception pointer, and then you have the SEH records. Those are actually two variables on the stack because that's eight bytes. So that's two four-byte pointers. And then you have the SEH handler, the scope table, and the tri-level. And then the bottom of the stack, basically. So this is a very simplified view of exactly what these SEH records are like. So the first pointer points to the next record. And the, the second pointer points off to the executable segment of the process, usually the .txt segment, to that exception handler's actually instructions. And then it, it chains all the way to the bottom, and then basically you have the default exception handler, which is that message that, I'm sorry, it's crashed and needs to close. Any questions? I know it's a lot of material for the for one lecture. So this is a very detailed view. I'm not gonna quiz you guys or test you guys on the components of this and the next one, but it's just here for your understanding. So this is um, the implementation, the third version of SEH uh, for Microsoft Visual C++. It's the SE. H3 layout. Basically, you have the local variables. Uh, we have the top of the stack. You have save registers, local variables, save to ESP. Um, and that's for handling the exceptions, um, which start with the exception pointers. And then you have the records, basically the next SEH frame, and then the SEH handler. Um, and then there's a scope table. Um, I don't think we'll be getting into the scope table unless it comes up in a particular exploit. Um, but later on, if you guys get into Windows stuff, you'll have to know what that is. So in the fourth implementation, they added things called cookies. We're going to get to cookies and stack cookies, uh, specifically the GS cookie, um, at the end of this lecture. Um, but almost out of time. So basically they added cookies. Cookies are randomly things generated at runtime and they're put in certain values, uh, put in certain places before important things. And then um, there's checks every now and then to make sure those cookies are still there. Because if there's a buffer overflow and overwrites the cookie, they now know that if that cookie is no longer there, there's been an overflow so I should exit to prevent malicious stuff from happening. So these are basically security mechanisms that were put in place. So they're canaries. Canaries, exactly. We'll we'll talk about that, but we're we're almost out of time. Um, so, uh, all right. So yeah, this kind of covers how SEH works. I'm gonna get into how SEH is exploited next time. So that's it for today's class. Um, so I'll stop it there. <laughs>